Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's talk is given by Bryant Guy. Tonight I was challenged to give a talk on something technical and complicated. And it was suggested a topic of that nature would be the five skandhas and how the Buddha thought they led to no self. So first we need to define a term, what's a skanda? Well, that's a term used in Sanskrit that means aggregate or heap or combination. And the Buddha 2,500 years ago, when he was sitting under the tree trying to figure out the problem of suffering, why do we suffer, uh, started turning the light of attention inward towards the person himself. Um, I don't know how much uh, speculation had been done or investigation about persons up to that point, but he really dug deep into what it is that a person is. Uh, and so one of the models that he came up with is this five aggregate model. Um, the five aggregates, as he defined them, are form, which is all the material aspects of the body, but also uh, all the material aspects of life. The second is feeling, which is not happy or sad. It's a more basic feeling. It means... When we have a contact with anything of form uh, in our body or in our mind, um, there's a pleasant or there's an unpleasant or there's a neutral feeling. So this feeling tone uh, is what is intended by the second aggregate. And then the third aggregate is usually defined as perception or discrimination or recognition. Uh, this entails the part of our experience where when we've come into contact with something and we've felt a tone about it, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, we're also simultaneously defining it from our experience. Do we recognize it? What is it? What are its characteristics? Which leads to the fourth aggregate, which is probably the one of the most uh, variously translated terms. The original term is samskara, but it's been called volitional formations, mental formations, uh, intentions, all kinds of things. And what this for fourth aggregate uh, really encompasses is everything that's not encompassed by basic feeling tone and basic perception uh, everything else in our experience is thrown into the basket of the fourth aggregate. So our actual emotions, our memories, our, our uh, habits and inclinations towards things. Uh, this is where karma resides, which is a whole other talk. Um, and so it's in the original Buddhist psychology called the Abhidharma, uh, there's over 50 different aspects of the self that they throw into this fourth aggregate, uh, all of which uh, lead to our experience of being a self. Uh, and then the fifth, finally, aggregate is usually translated as consciousness. And so the Buddha sitting under the tree um, you know, had a big realization about the way things are. And this five aggregate model uh, was one of the things that uh, was essential to his way of thinking and way of arriving at an answer about the way things are. And so when he decided to get out from under the tree and actually try and teach what he had realized, uh, his first talk ever, called Turning the Wheel of the Dharma, is where he got back together with his five ascetic pals that he had been doing asceticism with previously. 
and they were skeptical of him. Uh, but he looked really, uh, really saintly and holy all of a sudden. So they figured he might have figured something out. Let's listen to him. So the first discourse ever by the Buddha, turning the wheel of the Dharma, he lays out essentially the middle way between the two extremes of indulgence and asceticism. But then he hits him with the Four Noble Truths. And as defined by the Buddha, uh, the Four Noble Truths are the truth of suffering, the truth of how suffering comes to be, the truth of how suffering ceases, and the way, the path to follow to enable suffering to cease. And uh, when we use the word suffering, the original term is dukkha. And dukkha is not just suffering. It is one of the famously untranslatable terms in Buddhism uh, that means a whole host of things along the spectrum of suffering. Everything from the slightest, most infinitesimal disappointment or discomfort all the way to Shakespearean full-blown angst, anguish, and grief, and everything in between. So we're not just talking about, oh, I missed my favorite TV show. We're talking about, oh, I'm trying to thread a needle, oh, and I didn't get the needle in the hole the first time I did it. That teensy bit of frustration, everything to uh, sickness, illness, and death. All that is encompassed in dukkha. And he basically said in this first noble truth, um, and I will quote it, birth is dukkha, aging is dukkha, sickness is dukkha, death is dukkha. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are dukkha. Associating with what is unloved and displeasing is dukkha. Separation from what is loved and pleasing is dukkha. Not getting what one wants is dukkha. And then he ends the first noble truth with the final sentence, which is the key to this talk. He says, in short, the five aggregates subject to clinging are dukkha. So that's an interesting sentence. He hasn't mentioned the five aggregates up to now in this sermon, but I'm assuming his five listeners knew what he meant by that. So now I'll tell you what he meant by that. Um, he summarizes all of these different valences, these different aspects and instances of dukkha, of suffering, of pain, with the sentence stating that the five aggregates subject to clinging uh, is all of this. So the five aggregates subject to clinging are what I just enumerated a little bit ago, that it is form or materiality, the feeling tone of things, our perception or discrimination of them, uh, the formations that we start bringing to that feeling and that perception. And the formations, again, come from everything in our memories of our uh, entire lives. It comes from our habits. It comes from our emotions, all this stuff. Um, and one of the most important of the fourth aggregate aspects is intention or volition. It's what are we going to do about whatever this thing is in the moment. And then the fifth aggregate, consciousness, uh, is usually has been described to me in the past as where we appropriate this whole process as being self. It's where we conceive the idea that uh, I am the kind of person who whatever is happening with the other four aggregates. Uh, and so there's, there's that identification with this process. And then once we've identified with it, um, usually we feel that that is our self, whatever that is. Many of us probably don't introspect. We just assume that we have a self. But 2,500 years ago, the Buddha sitting under the tree said, let me, uh, let me look into that. Because at that time, there was considered something called Atman, which was considered your essential self. It made you you. 
And the, one of the Buddha's chief innovations, and probably why we have Buddhism today, uh, his thing that set him apart, was he said to society at the time, which was all Brahmanism, uh, he said, no, I haven't found this Atman anywhere. I'm going to declare the truth of not-self, Anatman. So, in brief, why are the five aggregates not self? Well, in the very next sutra, the very next discourse to the very same five guys that were his former ascetic pals, he gives the Anatalakana Sutra, which translated means the sutra on no self characteristics or not self characteristics. And in that sutra, he uses that same model of the aggregates to say that these five aggregates, all of them taken individually or as a group are impermanent when you really sit down and look at them. And then he asks the five guys, well, anything that's impermanent, is that also painful? And they agree, well, yes, things that are impermanent are painful. And then he asks, is anything that's impermanent and painful, could that be worthy of considering being a self? And they say, no, venerable sir, it is not worthy of being considered a self. And so then he sums up by saying, so therefore any kind of form, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness, whatever, uh, must with right understanding how it is, be regarded thus, this is not mine, this is not I, this is not myself. So this might not might be considered his first meditation instruction uh, to his new Sangha of the five ascetic guys. Um, and later, 200 years, a thousand years, um, a guy came along named Nagarjuna who started a whole other wheel in motion, which was an expansion of the not self idea of Buddha, which was the not self in our persons. And he said, well, if the person and everything that makes the person, you know, everything that we think makes the person, which are, you know, the five skandhas, if those are empty of a self, why isn't everything else? And so he set about and he did prove uh, logically that everything else in all of phenomena are empty of any kind of essential self. Um, there's a famous sutra with comparisons of these five aggregates by the Buddha to form being like a ball of foam on a river uh, feeling is like a water bubble on that same river. Any perceptions are like a shimmering mirage in summer. Uh, any formation is like the hollow trunk of a banana tree that has no heartwood. Uh, any cognition is like a, a magical illusion of a magician. And so the whole point he was driving home again and again in his career was that all the things that we think of that we can identify where we supposedly could find a self that we could identify with and say, this is me, all these things are actually empty of the very thing we're looking for. Uh, and that was pretty much the main body of his um, teaching throughout the rest of his 45 years uh, in that area of the world. And it comes down to us today in Zen temples all around the world, the Heart Sutra is chanted. And in the key passage of the Heart Sutra, we have form is emptiness, emptiness is form, and also feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness are like this, which is a capsulation of exactly what the Buddha first taught 2,500 years ago. So um, there you have it, folks. <laughs> uh, you have the five aggregates, a very technical aspect of Buddhism, but a very key aspect of the Buddha's basic message, which is that suffering leads uh, from the very identification with things that don't have any substance to them that we think they do. And so when we try to grasp them, cling to them in the hopes that they'll give us satisfaction, the Buddha says, 
because they're impermanent and because they don't have any permanent essence, uh, you're ultimately going to be disappointed. So don't even try to hold on or grasp in the first place. That doesn't mean things go away. It doesn't mean you go away. It just simply means that we don't apply a non-existent overlay to things that they don't really have.